All right, I'm Nick, and this is my wife, Nicole, and this is our giving story. So I was raised um, from a young boy with, you know, giving and a tithe. And so every time I had an allowance or any time I had any type of income, you know, my parents would sit me down and it was, okay, now what are you putting the tithe? I always wanted to give and, um, and practice that, you know, when when I was in church um, and throughout college and things like that, but it wasn't necessarily a practice that was taught to me. Um, and so really it was once we got married and our incomes came together and um, that I really started to understand, you know, that, um, that ob obedience piece. He's always provided. And as long as we're faithful, you know, we've never gone without. We were going through the process of adoption and we're getting ready for these huge payments and looking at the amount we're tithing and the Lord was so faithful to, sh to show himself, you know, we did an adoption fundraiser. We had one last payment we were struggling to make and we sat down and we were counting the pennies and, and cash. And I think like it came we're down within a few dollars, a few dollars of what we needed. And I remember just crying on the living room floor and feeling like the Lord was so faithful to us. And so I would just encourage people that the Lord says, test him just to step out in obedience and, and give it a try. Good morning. Uh, my name is Travis. That was actually my brother and sister. So uh, that's pretty cool how that worked out capturing that testimony. And I can, I can tell you from walking life with Nick and Nicole that they give and they give gladly. I've seen the impact and I've seen uh, the effect of how giving has transformed them. In fact, you guys all have a handout with you this morning, and it's titled Giving Gladly. Why should I give? And I, and I tell you what, giving helps people. And in the ways that my brother and sister have given, I've seen the direct impact of how that has helped. But more than anything, what I see in them is a transformation about how God has been shaping them to be more and more like him. Giving makes you more like Jesus. You'll never be more like God. You'll never be more like Jesus. You'll never be more Christian than when you give. Than when you give. Jesus himself, he stepped down from Godhood. He stepped down out of heaven. He humbled himself. He gave that up to become human to become fragile like you and I. And then he went further and he gave up his life on the cross for you and I. God, Jesus is about giving. And if you want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, I encourage you to give. It will transform you. It will transform you. This morning... We are in the third week of this message series. It's called How to Be What Jesus Says About Relationships. And he's got a lot to say about relationships. And, and this morning, I'm going to be sharing the first portion of the message. Uh, and then you guys will all hear from Pastor Colin as he dives into some deep practical realities of, of when we take our family and when we put it at the feet of the cross, it changes everything. And so I'm excited to be talking with you guys about that this morning. I want, I want to dive right in here. Uh, I play a, a couple of roles in family. In fact, all of us play several roles in family. Right now, the two roles that I have the most energy and the most focus in is the role of husband and the role of dad. And this is my family here. You can see uh, that's my wife, Lisa, and our three girls. The oldest is Annika, uh, the one middle-aged, middle-aged? That's probably not quite right. Um, 
the one in the middle, if you will, is Emma, and our youngest is Olivia. And man, they, they bring me so much joy. But I don't only wear the hat of dad and only the hat of husband, but as you saw already, I'm also brother. I'm son. I am grandson. I am cousin. I'm nephew. I'm uncle. I, I wear all of these hats. And then there's the, like, the second cousin, third cousin, and beyond. I, I don't really know those. Um, just call me either uncle or nephew and we'll be good, right, you know? So, but we all wear many hats in our families and some of my family relationships, they're wonderful and they're great and they're amazing and they're life-giving and, and some of my family relationships are terrible, quite terrible. Fa- family's complicated. Family is so complicated, uh, but here's what I know and here's what I believe. I think that we all want the same thing, regardless of who and what and how we define our family. We all want happy, healthy family, right? Nobody is thinking, oh man, I love a manipulative family. I love toxic, mean, rude people. Nobody thinks that. Nobody says, oh gosh, I hope my kids are disobedient and rebellious and snotty. Nobody wants that. We all, every one of us, we want happy, healthy family. In fact, Though there may be mean and toxic people in our family, the reality is we wish that our family was such that we could all be best friends. And to be honest with you guys, not only do we want that, but I know that Jesus wants that. That that is what Jesus wants for you. That's what Jesus wants for your family. And so today, we're going to explore some basic principles about relationship and how they relate to our families. We're going to be diving into the scripture to do that. And it's going to help us all walk towards happy, healthy family. Got it? You ready? All right. So grab your outline or open up the tab if you're online right here. Um, And the first thing is we've got to talk about some basic truths, things that are true for all of us when it comes to family. And the first, first truth is this, we all have the power to lead in our family. We all have the power to lead. If you can hear my voice right now, You have the power to lead in your family. Now, we think most often about the power of authority. And if you are a parent of young kids like I am, you have the power of authority. You tell them what to do and they have to do it or you bring the consequences, right? Most of family does not operate that way. You see, what we most have is the power of, of influence, the power of influence. We influence by the questions that we ask, by the thoughts we share, our our responses, our actions. It's all influence. And I got to tell you, influence is really powerful because with authority, you can modify behavior. But the power of influence goes deep into hearts. With your influence, with our influence, we're shaping our family's hearts and we're shaping our family's thoughts, the bedrock and the foundation of who they are. And everybody has the power of influence. The question is, are you using it or not? Because everything you say or don't say is influence. Everything you do or don't do is influence. Intentional or unintentional, it says something. It, it's influence. When you choose to not talk to a family member for a decade, that's influence. That's telling them about what you believe about forgiveness, what you believe about grace, and what you think God teaches about that. We all have the power of influence. You can't get away from it. You have it. Are you using it, and are you intentional, or are you unintentional about it? This is the reality. Every one of us has the power to influence in our families at every level. The second truth that we need to hang on to is the biggest impact you will have in your family comes out of who you are. The biggest impact you will have in your family comes out of who you are. I'm constantly telling parents, 
your kids will grow up to become you. They will not grow up to be what you tell them to be. They will grow up to be you. That's why Jesus teaches this principle in in Matthew 22. And there's this guy that comes to him and says, Jesus, what's the most important commandment? What's the most important thing that I need to focus on? What is the key in life? And Jesus, he shares these words, Matthew 22. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love others. And it's no accident that Jesus presents them in this order. Because your loving of others, your relationship with your family comes out of your relationship with God. It comes out of who you are. And so Jesus says, you want to make an impact on your family It's about who you are first. You've got to focus on you because who you are matters. You want happy, healthy family. You need to be healthy. And if you're here today and you're saying, great, I want that, I long for that, where do I begin? Where do I start? I encourage you to plug into our core classes. Our core class, they're they're coming up this next month And core class is designed as an entry step to understand what is God calling us to? Why on earth has he made us? What is our purpose in life? And it's going to give you the foundation of things that you need to be investing in in order to be a healthy person. And so I say again, you want happy, healthy family? You first, you've got to look at yourself because your leadership and your impact is going to come out of who you are. I think we all get that. But these are the foundational truths. We often want to gloss over them, but the reality is you have the power to lead and your leadership is going to come out of who you are. So now that we've established that foundation, let's take a look at some strategy. What do we need to do when we look at investing in our family to create happy, healthy family? The first thing is this, write it in. Lead with the end in mind. Lead with the end in mind. You see, we were created for eternity. We were created for eternity. This life is warm up, this life is practice, this life is the refining for eternity. We were created to live in a city, this new Jerusalem, where we are in perfect relationship with one another and perfect relationship with God. That's where we're headed. This life is preparation for the next life. And we need to be paying attention to this when we look at our family. Because it's so easy to get distracted I see it all the time with parents. I see parents that their focus is actually on sports or their focus is on academics or, or, or their kids meeting with financial success or getting into this college. And, and we have this like tunnel vision for these things and we focus it on them at the expense of really what life is about. Life is about refining ourselves and preparing ourselves to live together forever. To live together forever. Would you want to live with you forever? This life is about preparing for eternity. And so we need to be paying attention to this with our family relationships. Because we can create successful athletes, academic juggernauts, or computer geniuses, but if our kids grow up and they don't know Jesus and they're not in love with Jesus, what have we done? 
It's more important that our kids have a relationship with Jesus than they learn to read. Now, learning to read and all those things, they're good and they're healthy and they're a means to an end, but we so easily get caught up in what is temporary and we forget really what it's all about, really what it's all about. And so if you want happy, healthy family, you need to turn your eyes and pay attention to where you're going. That has got to be the goal. That is what you are working for with your aunt, with your uncle, with your cousins, with your kids, with your grandkids, with your grandparents. We're walking towards eternity. And we ought to conduct ourselves and lean into our relationships with that in mind. The second thing is we're, we're looking at building a strategy for happy, healthy families is we need to focus on what we can give rather than what you get. We got to focus on what we can offer and pour into family rather than what we get. And, and, and many of you would be here today and you'd say, well, obviously, of course, that's what, what have I spent my whole life doing? I mean, I've spent hundreds of thousand dollars of raising my kids and I pay for food and I, I do all these things. You're like, of course, that's what I do, right? But, but, but we really get a lot out of family. I mean, we really get so much out of healthy family. I mean, when my kids were born, their very existence unlocked things in my heart that I didn't even know were there. My parents, to this day, I'm an adult, I have kids, they're grandparents. To this day, my parents and my in-laws, they provide security to me. They provide help to me. They provide wisdom and experience and guidance. My brother, he provides a safe space for me to process. I mean, going back to my kids, my, my kids have given me joy to carry me through such dark and hard times. It's so easy to get focused on what family gives because it can be so good, but you have to be careful because this, this is a problem. If we focus on what we can get out of family rather than what we give, this is the, this is the root of so many family squabbles and, and so much tension and so much fighting and, and, and broken relationships. It's because we're thinking about what that person, what that family member ought to give me, ought to offer me. We've got to stop looking at what we can get. And we've got to stop expecting things from our family. You should be paying attention to what you can offer in relationship. What can you offer your kids as they grow? A lot. Not just the stuff. You have so much to offer. What can you offer your aging parents? Yeah, they're difficult. And yeah, they are going to take time. But what can you offer? What can you offer your kids now that you're an empty nester? Because it changes, doesn't it? What you can offer them is, is very different. And I, and I, I got to tell you, you got to be careful here. There's some nuance to this, right? Because so oftentimes, hidden behind what we're offering is really what we get. We're offering things to them because it makes us feel good. We're not really doing it for them, we're actually doing it for ourselves. I think about what can you offer a non-believing cousin, if you will. Well, so often we wanna hit them over the head about their sin or about their lifestyle because it makes us feel good that we've shared truth. But, But maybe we ought to offer the gospel in its reality, in relationship, in love, and in grace. And suddenly, that family gathering that you loathe, that family gathering that you dread, the people that you kind of want nothing to do with, I mean, everything changes. It, it, it's got purpose, it's got meaning, it's got value. And this is what living in God's kingdom does for family. So we've got to begin with the end in mind, and we've got to focus on what we can give. 
Now, Pastor Colin, he's going to come on out, and he's going to talk about how this can get super practical, right? With this mindset, how do we invest and lead our families? Here's Pastor Colin. know that you just roll your eyes all the time at your parents because you're like, you say that all the time and it's really annoying, right? Parents, I'm sure you've got that phrase. You just repeat it over and over and over again. Well, my parents had this phrase. My dad said this all the time over and over and over again. He would say, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Every day at, when he dropped us off for school, he would give us a high five and say, remember who you are. Everywhere that we went, it was always remember who you are. And growing up, I got annoyed with it. It was, I got tired of it, but I'm so grateful to this day that he chose to remind us to remember who we are. What it meant was to remember that you're a crane. You belong to the crane family. And remember that you belong to the family of God and that nothing can change to those two things. In fact, uh, they, they even did this even further. When I was going into high school, um, going from eighth grade into high school, promotion, graduation, whatever they call it now. Uh, going into high school, my family organized this dinner with a bunch of pastors and mentors and friends. Travis was actually one of them. Uh, Kevin and Ronnie and Kyle and some of the, my grandpa, some of these people in my life who've just been foundational uh, to speak into my life. They came over for dinner and uh, we ate some good food. Of course, you know, what else do you do when a bunch of guys come over? And, uh, and they came over and we, they just got, they just spoke truth into my life about who I was, who I was becoming. They wrote these letters for me. I found them the other day. They're actually just right here. I brought them with me. Uh, man, and, and they just said some things that I was so encouraged by to this day. I mean, what an incredible gift that even today, like they, they spoke into things that weren't just temporary behaviors, but lifelong character that what they wanted me to see live out. My dad would say things like, uh, like, man, you care deeply for people. And he pointed out specific situations about, man, how uh, you, he, he said, Colin, you are someone who cares for the person who feels left out. Uh, and he said things like, uh, like, as you go into high school, embrace your uniqueness. Embrace the way that God's created you. And don't try to conform to the way other people act or behave or dress or those kind of things, right? In high school, what a great reminder for in high school. Uh, Kevin, Kevin said some things on, uh, I've got a page in here somewhere, it's in here, uh, where Kevin wrote out, Man, this is who Colin Crane, this is who God says Colin Crane is. And Colin, uh, Colin is justified. He is called, given grace. My grandpa said things like, uh, man, remember to prepare your heart everywhere you go and line it up with God's heart. Uh, and I could go on and on about what these people said, but I'm so grateful that I had people in my life who spoke into who I was and who I was becoming because it encouraged me to this day. I had people who, man, understood Travis's point of making sure that we, we focus on what we can give rather than just what we can get and focus on the end in mind. And I want you to know, uh, man, that, that you might look at this and you might go, that's great for you, that's awesome for you, but, but listen, like, it's never too late for you to be this for your family. It's never too late for you to do this, to be like this for your kids or for kids to influence your family in this way. This, uh, man, you have influence in your family. Regardless of the role that you play, you have an opportunity to live this out, to lead them in the right direction. So the question is, well, well how do I do that, right? How do I lead my family well, well, it's a great question. Uh, we came up with just four things that I think are helpful. There's probably like millions of things, right? But we came up with just four things that are, I think are helpful, and uh, sometimes acronyms help us remember things, so hopefully this helps us remember. So when we talk about leading, L-E-A-D, uh, we're going to talk about four things that start with those letters, uh, and, uh, and, and talk about how these things can help us lead our families well. So you ready? Are you ready? 
All right. So when it comes to leading your family well, you've got to do this first one. You've got to look for gospel opportunities. Everybody say look. You've got to look for gospel opportunities. I grew up in a family that had, uh, I had four brothers, okay? Four brothers. So you can imagine that we were, we were a family that we loved to wrestle. We loved to fight. We loved to hit each other. It got us in a lot of trouble a lot of times. I mean, ca- caused some black eyes and stitches and lots of things, right? But th- what else do you do when you live a family of boys? That's what we do, right? In fact, one of the things we did in the car is uh, we played a game called, uh, I think we called it Slug Bug, right? And if you probably know what that game is, but in case you don't, basically if you're driving in the car, uh, as you're in the car, we're in the back seat because we're kids, we can't drive yet, and we are driving, and we're on the lookout for Volkswagen bugs, right? And the moment that we see one, the first person to yell out slug bug gets to do what? They get to slug the person next to them in the arm, right? They get to punch the person next to them as hard as they can in the arm. It was, it was the best, right? Because, I mean, I'm the older brother. I got to put them in their place. That's what we got to do. And so th- this is what we did. We, it's, we kept an eye out for, uh, for the slug bugs, and we had to make sure that we were the first ones to find it. Because what an awesome opportunity to punch your brother. It got us into trouble. I, I think that this is why my parents, like, in the car often, we, he, they would make us sit on our hands all the time. Parents, feel free to use that one. That one... Is pretty good, but uh, I didn't like it when I was a kid, but probably today I'll do it at some point. But th- this is the point. This is the point. We were, we were actively looking for the bug, or the slug bug, right? Making sure that we were the first one to find it. Because one, we didn't want to get hit, and two, we really wanted to hit our brother. What if, what if, that's kind of ridiculous, but what if, what if we put the same kind of excitement into seeing God in our everyday, ordinary life. What if, what if we chose to keep our eyes open for the way that God is working and moving and offering grace in everyday life? Man, God is present, God is there, God's grace. The fact that you have breath in your lungs this morning is a gift of God's grace. But do we point to it and do we look to it and do we tell our family that? is the question. Looking for gospel opportunities is simply just pointing, uh, looking out for chances to say, hey, that is God. Hey, look how good God has been. Hey, man, my life, th- this is really difficult in my life, but God has been faithful, and I trust that he will be faithful in the future. This is a gospel opportunity. What if, what if our family got in the habit of just looking at our life and going, hey, that was God. Hey, remember when God did this hey, we know that God is going to do this. What if our family got in the habit of saying this? Deuteronomy reminds us, it says it like this in chapter six. He says, you must love the Lord your God. This sounds familiar with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And he says, you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Tie them on your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts and on your houses and on your gates. He, what he's saying is you got to love God with everything and talk about God in everything. The fact that God has, again, given you breath in your lungs. Talk about that with your family and your kids. Show them that is a gift from God's grace. He says in everything that we do, sometimes we feel the pressure, right, to manufacture moments of of worship or moments where we talk about God in our family. Man, but what if, that's not what it says. What if we just spent every single moment waking and sleeping and on the road and in the house and it says tie them on your, your hands and write them on your forehead. Maybe don't get a tattoo on your forehead that God is good, but I don't know, right? There's something, like remember that God is good and it's worth talking about and it's worth telling our family about it. Everywhere you go, all the time, look for opportunities to remind each other of the gospel. Parents, Parents, if you want your kids to grow up knowing that God is good, then tell them that he's good. Show them that he's good. Point out the ways. It's really easy for us, parents or not parents, it's really easy for us to look at our world and it, it's really come natural to us to complain or to say, man, this is terrible or to be negative. It's really easy for us to say, man, this is really difficult. But, but what if it became even more natural for us to say, but God is faithful and God is good and we trust that he is with us. And what if you made a habit of going around your dinner table and just saying, hey, this is how I saw God today at work or at school. How did you see God? 
What if you just made that a habit at, at your dinner table in your family? No matter your role in the family, what if you just actively looked for opportunities to serve them? You know, what if, what if uh, you know how on our birthdays, we treat kind of, or we treat our family, really anybody, we treat our family, though, different on their birthday, don't we? We treat them like, like we're a little bit more forgiving. Our annoying little brother, like they're still annoying. They're still the annoying little brother. But we treat them, we're a little bit more forgiving to them. We, we're a little bit more willing to serve them. I mean, it's their birthday, right? And, but, but what if, what if we chose to treat everyone in our family like it was their birthday every day? Not just one day a year, but we chose to serve them. This is a gospel opportunity. It's an opportunity to point to Jesus and what he's done for us. We've got to keep our eyes open. Man, if we're going to lead our families, we've got to look for gospel opportunities. And if we're going to notice these moments, we can't just sit back and wait for them to happen to us. We have to actively engage and pay attention, which leads us to this second one. Uh, We've got to look for gospel opportunities, and we've got to engage actively. We've got to engage actively. Just this, uh, this last week, I had a moment where, man, I was tempted. Uh, I was tempted to tune out and get upset with my daughter, June. Her name's June. Uh, I think there's a picture of her. There was a picture of our family, but you can just show the picture of her. That's, her, that's June. Um, oh, you can say, oh, right, oh, whatever. I had this moment on Thursday night. It was Thursday night. I had this moment where I came home from work. We, she, we had got home, and she was, she was hungry, okay? And listen, she doesn't just get hungry, she gets hangry. Like, I'm telling you, she is so hungry, and she yells, and she screams, and she wants food now, right? Some of you parents in the room, you know what I'm talking about. Your kids just get hangry. I mean, they, as you grow up, like, we get this way, right? Hangry. And so she's hangry. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to make her some food and make her some mac and cheese and do all the things. But you know, if you are a football fan, Thursday night was the first night of football, right? And, and so what I want to do is I, as I'm making her mac and cheese, as I'm doing the whole thing, she's, you know, I wanted her to just go do her own thing. But she's like a one and a half year old. She doesn't want to do that. She wants to be involved. She wants to be part of it. She wants to be held by her dad. And, and, uh, but I, what I want to do is I want to go and I want to look for the ways to watch the football game. And I want to make sure that my fantasy football team is all good. I want to be on my phone and do this while I stir the mac and cheese and do all the things. But she's at my feet and she's screaming at me. Listen, I'm telling you, like, I'm not exaggerating when I say screaming. She's got some lungs on her, okay? She's either going to sing her like her mom or she's just going to scream for a living. I don't know, but she can scream. And so she's at my feet screaming at me. And I have a moment, I had a moment where I started to get upset with her. I started to get mad. And you're like, how could you get upset with that little girl right there, right? And it's like, no, listen, she wasn't that cute at the time. She was screaming, <laughs> okay? And, but, but, but I had a moment where I was about, to, I was getting upset with her. And I had to take a second and just take a step back and realize how dumb I was being. How ridiculous was I? Man, I was going to refuse my daughter a a chance to spend time with her dad just because I wanted to spend time watching stupid football that I can go watch back later. And so I put the phone down. I picked her up. Yeah, like my arm gets tired holding her. And, you know, I let her stir sometimes. And she makes a massive mess. And it takes me way longer to do anything. but, But she loves it. And I didn't get to watch the football game, but man, I got to spend time with my daughter. And what a gift that is. What a gift that is. We have to be careful and attentive to how we think about our family and how we think about the people we live with. We are far too easily disengaged or lazy or apathetic toward our family. And I don't just mean parents. I mean everybody in the house. We need to watch out for this kind of attitude. We've got to be careful Man, we take, maybe we take the responsibility of parenting as a burden rather than a gift that we've been given. Or we're so distracted about what's going on in our world that we can't engage with the people we live with and we tune them out. And so we need to ask ourselves, what's distracting me? What's keeping me from spending quality time with my family? Is it our TV? Is it your phone? Is it just laziness? Man, is it you're too busy? Are you valuing work over family time? Man, do I use work or school as an escape from the responsibility in my home? If, I were to, if we were to look at your screen time and compare it to your family time, how would it add up? Man, what are you saying to your family when you tune them out and you're on your phone when they just want to hang out with you? We're looking at our kids or our family or whoever it is, and we're just saying they're nothing more than an interruption. Parents... I heard someone talk about it the other day. Parenting is not an interruption. If you've been given the privilege to parent, 
Man, that is the objective. Everything else is the interruption. Parenting is the objective. Everything else is the interruption. If you say you value your kids, show them. We talk about more is caught than taught. Man, if you, your kids, your, the people in your family will learn more from your actions than your words. Show them. Put down the phone. Turn off the TV. Man, make family dinners a priority. Put away the phones at family dinner time. Teenagers, come out of your room and spend time with people that care about you. No matter the role we play in our family, we've got to engage with the people closest to us. Man, in the Bible, there's a, a, a guy named Joshua. Everybody say Joshua. He reminds the Israelites of the importance of actively choosing to serve and worship God. And he says this in Joshua 24. He says, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose. Everybody say choose. Choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But he says, as for me and my family, we will do what? We will serve the Lord. And I understand that some of us, we've heard this, and, and actually the reason we've heard this, we know this, is because it's on all the cheesy Christian signs that we hang up in our house, right? But understand something. This is more than just a cheesy Christian sign you have up in your house. And that's great. I'm glad you have it in your house. But live it out. Don't just have it hanging up. Man, choose to say, in our house we serve and worship Jesus. And model that for your family. Serving the Lord is not a passive thing, it's active. You have the opportunity to model that regardless of your role. You can either actively choose to worship the Lord or passively end up worshiping yourself. Man, who will you worship? Parents, I want you to understand that you are the primary discipler of your kids. The, the question for your kids is not, is not, are my kids being discipled? The question is, who or what will they be discipled by? Who's discipling your kids? Is it you or is it TikTok? Is it, do they come for you to ask questions or do they go to Google? Man, do you know who your kids are following on social media? Man, we let our kids hit follow, 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 but do we know where they're leading them? Do you, are you paying attention? You've been given this responsibility and privilege. The goal is not just to raise good kids that make good decisions. The goal is to raise godly kids that love Jesus. And that starts with you. That starts the way that you model to them. You've got to actively engage with them. Our goal as the church is to partner with you as the family to disciple your kids. Our goal with all the conversations that we have in kids ministry and in junior high and in high school is that we would start the conversation and they would go home and continue the conversation in their family. That's what this is about. Church is absolutely important. In fact, you need to make church a priority in your family. Church, being part of small groups and being part of those things is so much more important than all the other things we sign our kids up for. But we need to understand that we can't just drop them off and think that our, our responsibility ends there. That they're with us for maybe a couple hours. They live with you. Man, you need to be talking to your kids about sex you got to be talking to your kids about dating. you got to be talking to your kids about pornography and friendships and, and drinking and commitments and all the other things we could go down the list. And some of us, we say, that's scary. How do I do that? Well, your job is to lead them to Jesus. Your job is to say, in this family, we serve and worship Jesus. So what does Jesus say about these things? Go back. I mean, it doesn't have to have this. We're here to help you. We're here to partner with you when you're at this place of I don't know how. But man, bring it back to Jesus consistently to show them this is what Jesus says about these things. Maybe you're not a parent, but you have the opportunity to model what it looks like to worship and serve Jesus to the people in your home. So, so how can you make that a priority? It doesn't happen by accident. The people you live with, they're not just roommates. That's your family. And, and maybe the way that you can engage with them closely is just to start by being honest. Start by being vulnerable with your family, which leads us to the A. We've got to look for gospel opportunities. We've got to engage actively, and we have to apologize often. We've got to apologize often. This one should be pretty straightforward. We know what this means. We know what it looks like to apologize. We know we should apologize, but being this honest and vulnerable with your family is, is not always comfortable. And I get it. It's difficult to be honest with those closest to us. 
But choosing to own up to your mistakes and apologize is an opportunity to point back to the grace of Jesus that you've been offered to. And to say to your kids or to your parents, to whoever they are, to say, I need Jesus just as much as you do. And say, I'm not perfect and neither are you. Let's go to Jesus together. And, and we know that, that when it comes to apologies, there's a difference between like a sincere apology and that apology that your parents made you do when you were kids, right? Where your parents is like, apologize to your brother. And you're like, sorry, right? You're like, whatever. I, I mean, okay, we, like, we hang out with high school students and I've seen it, all right? High school students are like, I'm sorry, whatever, right? And they're just, always that ends with the whatever. And, or, or it's like, I'm sorry you feel that way, right? Or it's, I'm sorry, but you did this. It's like, it's not my fault, you did this, right? That's a fake apology. We need sincere apologies. Man, I'm sorry I raised my voice at you. You don't deserve to be talked that way. I, I'm sorry I said those things to you. I don't believe that about you. This is a gospel opportunity pointing back to the first one, a moment to point to the gospel because we know that the Bible says we've all fallen short, we've all messed up, yet why do we pretend like we're perfect with the people closest to us? We need to go, hey, I've messed up too, and we have the freedom to confess and apologize because we've been forgiven. First John 1, 9, it says, we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us and cleanse us from all wickedness. We can apologize and confess because we know what Jesus has done and accomplished on the cross. When we believe in the gospel, no mistake is fatal because of what Jesus has done. How cool is it that you get the opportunity to tell your kids, to tell your family, hey, I'm sorry for what I've done, and point back to trusting in the grace of Jesus instead of pretending like you have it all together. This can lead your family to fall deeper in love with Jesus, which leads us to this last one. We've got to look for gospel opportunities. We've got to engage actively. We have to apologize often, and we've got to delight in Jesus. We've got to delight in Jesus. A couple uh, weeks ago, I was in this room uh, during worship, and I think I was over off to this right side, and there was a couple, uh, there was a family, a uh, few rows in front of me. And during one of the songs, uh, man, I, I noticed that the dad had, had raised his hand in, in worship. It was a worship moment. He had raised his hand. And he had, there was a, his son was next to him, probably about four or five years old. And I watched as the dad just did what was natural to him in worship. I watched as the son looked up at his dad and just imitated him. And he just raised his hands in worship. He's looking up at his dad and he's worshiping. And it was this incredible moment where I got to see this family have this worship moment together. And this wasn't forced. It wasn't manufactured. The dad didn't have to get down to his son and say, hey, son, this is what we do. This is why we do it. This is how we do it, blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. The father just was so in love with Jesus that he said, in this moment, Jesus deserves all glory and all praise and all of my worship. And I'm just going to raise my hands. And then his son caught on and said, hey, I'm going to do the same thing. And do we delight in Jesus is the question. Does your family, does your family notice that you delight in Jesus? To delight in Jesus is to be overcome, overwhelmed, and compelled by the love of Christ. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians, for the love of Christ does what? Controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake was raised. And then in Colossians, he says, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Man, when the message of Christ gets in us, it does something outside of us. It changes us. It should change us on the outside, and people should notice. When we're transformed by the person of Jesus, and people should see the difference, especially the people closest to us in our family. When we delight in Jesus, it's contagious. The joy of the Lord can draw people in. And let your family see you, catch you delighting in Jesus. Let your family catch you spending time in God's word. Let your family catch you worshiping. If you have unbelieving family members, your job isn't to just list all the things they do wrong. That's not what Jesus would do. No, your what if, what if we were people who just showed them what they're missing by enjoying Jesus and enjoying the grace that we've been given? 
You know, all the other things we talked about, looking for gospel opportunities, engaging actively and apologizing often, they become so much easier, so much more natural when we delight in Jesus. When we understand the gospel, understand what we've been given. Rather than feeling like we have to manufacture, put together these discipleship moments for our family, they just happen naturally because we are delighting and enjoying Jesus. Are you regularly delighting in Jesus? Man, we know that being part of a family can be difficult at times, but the truth is, we've all got family. And so let's be people who lead our family. Let's be people who look for gospel opportunities, who engage actively, who apologize often, and delight in Jesus regularly. Man, our families would be different if we were to lead intentionally our families would change. How cool would it be if we as the church began to show the world what what God has intended, God's design for family? Man, you understand that neighborhoods could be transformed by the way you lead your family. Man, what what if the change that we desire and want for school systems could start with your family trusting in Jesus? Will we lead our family well? Let's be people that choose to lead people, lead our family to Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for the families represented in this room. Man, we know family can be so complicated. Families can be tough. It can be difficult to relate to our family, and we desperately, God, need your help. We want to be people that influence and lead our family to you. Jesus, would you do something in us to show us the love that you have for us, the way that you created us so that we might do the same for others. Lead us to love you deeper. Show us, man, help us to see the ways where we're we're tempted to disengage and be lazy and challenge us to step in when it's hard, when we're tired and we just wanna do something else. Help us to take the moment to step in and engage with our family and show them the love that you've showed us. Jesus, would you transform our families? We need your help and we trust you. In your name, amen.